coming in and yeah, presenting today on data visualization and how uh, using this as a communication tool can really um, help advance the science of work at your organization. It's not going well, right? Yes. Okay. Well, thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Wait, so I need to hit the next button and then I go. Yes. Okay. All right. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. All right. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> The appetite for data-driven insights about employees is increasing, especially with increased amounts of data being available. And I'd argue that as IOs, we have a great opportunity to really lead this space through advanced analytics. Deloitte is not unique. The mission of our internal people analytics team is to rely on data-driven insights with our employee decisions. And to do so, we rely on analytics across the whole talent life cycle. We partner with multiple groups, and we rely on advanced expertise from multiple disciplines. Each of these disciplines come with their own unique data and jargon and methods. So we are, as leaders, not only faced with trying to make sense out of all of these, but also face challenges around communicating them effectively to our leaders. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that while all of us here might be regularly exposed to the area of analytics and we try to keep up with this increased level of sophistication in methods, this may not necessarily be the case for our average HR professional and leaders. So today I really want to talk about two things. Number one, get to the basics and talk about some principles from cognitive psychology that should influence any data visualization. Second, I want to argue that there's great benefit in talking about complex methods and want to share some tips of doing so. One of my favorite principles in the area of cognitive psychology is around decluttering. So our brains are wired to detect nuances, such as tiny differences in spacing as meaningful. Our brains prefer simplicity over complexity. Our brains also really like pretty things. And research <laughs> has shown that aesthetic designs can promote creativity, problem solving, and ultimately make, every, make the visual more acceptable. All right, yet we don't do that. We include too many visualization tactics, such as colors, light, size, and font variations, all of which increase cognitive load and distract from the main point. We tend to use over and to overuse lines, such as seen here, and overuse color, such as seen here. Again, um, irrelevant to the message and distract us. We also expect the audience to extract insights on their own, as you see on the next slide. We tend to not spend enough time on visually communicating our main point. We can narrow our audience's attention by using contrast strategically, as seen here in the middle, and by simply picking the right visual. All right, um, there are circumstances uh, where you do want to explain how you got there. In other words, your analytical and research methods. For us at Deloitte, the most important point for doing, a reason for doing so, was that we had to establish trust and credibility with our leaders as our team was so new. Conveying the rigor that went into your methodologies to establish a trust and credibility without completely overwhelming the audience was really, really hard. So looking back at the last two years, we realized that we are coming back to two general principles. <coughs> Number one, providing analogies, and number two, putting methods in context. And I want to talk about a few examples of how we did so. <clears throat> so in this first example, um, we tried to explain market basket analysis to our leaders. Uh, we used this method to generate a data-driven firm-wide skill taxonomy that could ultimately influence the way we hire, develop, and deploy our professionals. Um, but what in the world is market basket analysis? <laughs> in essence, it's very similar to the algorithm Netflix uses to cluster its movies together. That analogy was not only sticky, but it also illustrated the rigor behind our data-driven skill taxonomy proposal. At Deloitte, we are of course also experimenting in a hot area of organizational network analytics. But how do you explain your findings given that the usual methodologies rely on looking quite complicated network configurations? Our learning do not use common terms such as o, uh, common O and A terms, right? It just confuses your audience. Instead, so don't say high performers have higher between us metrics. Instead, <laughs> use more tangible metrics to communicate your findings, such as higher performers connected with seven more teams. 
In our final project, we ran analytics around the predictors of job performance. So our significant predictors, things that we as an organization have control over, accounted for 23% of the variance in performance. That's fantastic, right? But how do you get leadership excited about that number? So we decided to put numbers in context by providing more commonly understood relationships, such as the ones, like the examples that you see here. They got really excited about acting on the 23%. <laughs> All right, um, and I want to recap, and I'm going to read out the slides here. Declutter your visuals, spend time on aesthetics, make it easy for the audience to digest the main point. There is great benefit around covering advanced research methods, but use analogies and context of doing so. Thank you.